Good morning, everyone. My name is Mara Walsh, and I'm a founding partner at Pharma Voice. I would like to welcome you all to our WOW Woman of the Week one day virtual event. For all of us here at Pharma Voice, it is an honor to have you with us. So thank you for joining us. Before I introduce my friend and colleague and our event chair for today's event, I would like to take some time to invite you to connect and engage in our lounge, participate in our networking breaks, to be active in our sessions and discussions with the Q&A and with the polling system that we have in place today. We ask that you rate the sessions and provide feedback along the way. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to our event partner, Sherry Gelfen at Momentum, or you can reach out to me. We are both here and happy to help you. I wanted to also take a minute to thank our amazing panelists, a completely stellar list of amazing and accomplished women. We are thrilled and excited to have you all here, so thank you. In addition to our panelists, we want to recognize our partners for today's event. Bioforum, Green Fire, Cario Farm, W2O, and WCG. Thank you very much for supporting our event. Please take a moment to visit our partners by clicking on the exhibitors icon on the menu bar. Now, I would like to review our virtual platform with you very quickly. It is a really great platform and encourages interactivity. It's extremely user friendly. So take some time to explore it. We invite you to interact, participate, ask questions, request meetings, attend networking bre breaks, fill out the polls, and rate every session and the panelists. Just check out all the buttons on the menu bar and connect with everyone and anyone you'd like to here today. As part of our efforts to make this experience as engaging as possible, We'll be doing an Amazon gift card giveaway based on your overall engagement as event attendees. You can earn points by posting on the event feed, asking questions, voting on polls, setting up meetings, and visiting our partner booths. All of these activities gain you points. Your points position you in the way in which we will be calculating the winners. On the leaderboard center at the top right hand of the platform, you will always see your position throughout the day. We'll announce the attendees who come in first, second, and third place at the end of the day at our happy hour. Thank you all. And now I would like to start our first panel discussion and introduce our chairperson and moderator for this event. Many of you know her, but in case you don't, her name is Taryn Grome. She is the editor and co-founding partner at Pharma Voice. Now, Taryn, if you're ready, I'll give you the floor. Take it away. Thanks, Mara. I am ready. And thank you so much for that great introduction to the day ahead. Wow, what a day we have in store for you. And pun, totally intended. Welcome to our first Woman of the Week or WOW event. And it's not a coincidence that this event is in keeping with Women's History Month and just a few days ahead of International Women's Day on March 8th. We have assembled a terrific group of leaders who are going to be with us throughout the day for our four panels. All of their bios can be found on the event site. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. These words ring especially true as it relates to all of our panelists today, including this morning's stellar panel of C-suite executives who in their own ways, big and small, have thoughtfully committed to change the world, the world of healthcare. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Sharon Callahan, CEO of CDM. She's also Chief Client Officer at Omnicom Health. Lori Cook, President and CEO of the Healthcare Businesswomen's Association. Dr. Deborah Dunsire, President and CEO of H. Lundbeck, and Melinda Richter, Global Head, J Labs, Johnson & Johnson. Welcome, ladies. You are truly a power group, 
And before we dig into the content for today's session, which is going to cover several topics, including the keys to creating your roadmap to success, overcoming self-doubt and finding your voice, advice that you would give to your younger selves, and the wow moments that impacted your careers. I'd like to ask each of you to provide one or two words that describe your leadership style and why to kick us off. Sharon, since we're gonna go in alphabetical order, I'm gonna start with you. Thanks, Taryn, and thanks for having me here today. Um, my two words are partnering and decisive. Um, I think I am at my best when I'm working with a team that I've, I've put in the time and effort that actually all of us have put in the time and effort to build strong bonds. And, um, and I really feel my style is not kind of authoritative or commanding. It's really like, let's partner together. And then decisive. Um, there's a little tension there because while I believe everyone has a voice, you have to make a decision at the end of the day. And I'm not afraid to make decisions. That's great. And I would agree with both of those words, knowing you. So awesome. Lori, I will turn to you next. I would say positivity enabler. And I say that because I see opportunities and not messes in those uh, clean up on aisle three moments. Um, and I coach people and teams to come up with you know, creative solutions so they feel valued and they know they are seen. And I think that's what makes people really love their work and love their work environment. And we spend a lot of time at work, so it's really important to feel that uh, you really are valued. So that's what I would say, positivity enabler. And I'm yellow. And you are yellow, as I am yellow. <laughs> so I understand that. Uh, Deborah, I'll turn to you now. Thanks, Tara, and thanks for creating this event for us to participate. You've created a number of fabulous panels that are going to go on throughout the day. Thank you. I think the two words uh, for me would be patience and better. And you, for, for me, it's it's always been about how we can transform the lives of people living with, with diseases, be it cancer, be it depression, uh, be it rare genetic disorder, whatever it is. If, if I can be associated with teams that are changing the outcomes for people who are having to live with difficult uh, diseases, then I feel that I can uh, be motivated and uplifted and that my days matter. And so for me, it's keeping the patient at the, at the center of everything we do. And better is simply that I, I can't help myself. I, I demand of myself and my teams that we be better tomorrow than we are today. And it's just something that's, that's inside of me that on behalf of the patients, we, we just have to continue to do better, deliver medicines that are more transformative, deliver them faster, deliver them with more patient input. So those are the two that I'd pick. I like that. I also strive to be better every day. It doesn't always work, but I try. <laughs> Linda, I will turn to you now. Uh, so first of all, Taryn, thank you for having me here. And I'm so inspired to be in this room of amazing women. Um, I'm going to break the rules again a little bit. Uh, Shocking. Okay, you do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pair words together. Um, the first is authentic and open. And uh, for me, that is about making sure everybody has a seat at the table and we're not filtering the information we're being real we're saying everything like it is and bringing everybody's best selves to the table to figure out the solution and the only way you can do that is if you're open with everything not just what's going on at work but what's going on at home uh, and that creates a safe environment for everyone to share what is going on for them and the second would be bold yet principled so I believe you have to be out in front, similar to what Sharon said, you have to be out in front thinking six steps ahead and making those big choices to pave a way for your team, but it has to be on a bedrock of fairness and equity and justice and, and uh, ethics. And I think if you put those together, you have a really powerful combination. I agree, those are four words that are very powerful and they combine beautifully. 
to describe your leadership style as well. Um, thank you all for that. And let's get started for what is going to be truly a lively conversation. Uh, it's no secret that you all are very successful and inspiring leaders. Um, so we're going to talk about what were some of the keys to creating your roadmap to success. And then what are some of the things that other women should consider as they plot their course to the C-suite? Uh, Deborah, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. Um, I know that you have some thoughts that you um, have global experience is one of the things that you have identified, but talk to me about what are some of the other areas? So one of the things I'd say, first of all, is I, I don't think there's a road map. I think that it's, for me, um, I never anticipated being in this in this position as a CEO of a, of a, of a global company, uh, but I kept doing work that I enjoyed, uh, that I felt motivated by, and looking at learning different things. So that curiosity opened up opportunities that I never did and that were a bit non-traditional. Um, and taking those different steps, going towards work that I found interesting, enjoyable, that I could learn from, uh, eventually ended up in a place that, that took me to the leadership of uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies. So I think it's being open uh, to experiences that are not linear uh, going, you know, I see a lot of people focused on just going to the next level in their uh, current discipline where they're most uh, secure, I guess. But getting breadth in experience is also really important if you aspire to uh, company leadership or, or general management. And sometimes that's easier to do earlier in a career than, than later. So sometimes thinking a bit laterally is really important. And that's some place where geographic um, moves can fit in very well. I think being in different locations, truly having to adjust your expectations, having to learn that not everything you thought was uh, just the way things are really is the way things are everywhere and you can really learn from having to test your own assumptions and challenge your firm firmly held beliefs that are not based purely on fact so those those types of experience that broaden you give you range of approaches to different problems are also important in in a leadership journey and perhaps i'll stop there I thought that was great. And for not having a roadmap, you've done pretty darn good, I would say. But I also, I, I love the fact that you said curiosity, because I think that is a common theme from all of the C-suite folks that I speak to, is that intense um, willingness to be open to new ideas and to could be continually learning about new things and new areas. Uh, Lori, I'm going to turn to you. You lead the Healthcare Business Women's Association, and you have the opportunity to mentor and guide a number of women in their careers. Talk to me about what are some of the things that you learned along the way and what were some of the keys to your success? So I agree with what Deborah just said. Um, and I do see a lot of people really focused on that path and there's one path and it's, and it's going straight up. So the first thing I'd want to do is to acknowledge that not everyone wants to be um, in the C-suite. Now, um, you know, and, and just uh, accept um, people have different um, lifestyles, different goals, different environments they're working in. But it is really nice to set your goals quite high, because if you don't if you don't meet them, then where you ended up is probably further than you you even had um, imagined. So that's a Carolyn Bucklew's uh, setting your decade plan. So you're really going for gusto um, and you end up someplace um, in a more intentional way. So I do think the intention is what's important versus this very specific discrete um, path. Um, the second thing I, uh, I would say is you you need to have your learnings through your mentors, your, your, your sponsors, your experiential learning as a volunteer. Um, and, um, and traditionally, people can um, focus on either hard or soft skills. And I think both of, of those are really important. And so my example is, um, 
I do see women focusing on on trying to get important assets like how to um, speak up in meetings or uh, confidence and how to say no. And sometimes they're not spending as much time on on the finance, business, strategy. And those are critical. um, Really, those are tickets, um, table stakes that you have to have to get to the higher levels. So I do think it's important that you need to um, to have your chops um, in, in those areas if you're really aspiring to be at that top level. Now, how you get them is where I'd echo what uh, Deborah said, going into different environments, going into different countries in, in the world, it really does broaden you. So um, one final thing is, Women have um, quite often in a more innate way, uh, some things that we don't necessarily have valued and now we are valuing them much more. So just think country leaders like New Zealand's um, uh, Jacinda Arden. Um, She is uh, someone who has empathy and many of the world's leaders um, who practice empathy did significantly better managing the pandemic. So all of a sudden now empathy is like this number one skill. So I think we should do a, a bit of an inventory of what our skills uh, are and what we think um, we need to get and you figure out different ways to get there. I agree. If we, as we look to the future, the skills and that got us to here are not going to be the ones that take us into the future. Uh, as you noted, the empathy, which was very undervalued as a critical skill in leadership 10, five years ago, but now it has really moved up the ranks as to mm-hmm being one of those critical areas that CEOs and C-suite folks need to be focused on. Um, Sharon, I'm going to put some words in your mouth. You think it's about bringing your whole self to work and being authentic. But I want you to build on that because I know you are a truly authentic leader. Sorry, I had to get off mute. Um, You know, I I think it's really about being who you are with people. Melinda said it earlier, Um, bringing, um, you know, what's going on at home and what's going on at work. Uh, If you uh, if you can't uh, be all present and and people don't know why, then they're going to lose trust in you. Um, I'll give you a really good example. I was doing um, a workshop on authentic leadership at a, at a pretty small pharma company where there were very few women in leadership roles. Uh, one of them was in the legal department. And we're sitting around this table and I could tell this woman who was running the legal department was kind of off to the side. And we got into this very frank discussion about why women weren't getting ahead at that company. And um, they felt that they had to wear a mask when they went to work every day. Um, Anyway, one pretty brave woman said to this woman in the legal department, you know, you're one of the top people and you report to the CEO and you don't help anybody. And... um, you know, and sort of went off on that, that, you know, we don't know you, you don't, you don't usually come to things like this. And the woman looked at her and said, it's because my son is a drug addict and I spend probably as much time as I spend at work trying to help him and chasing him you know, finding him in a crack house in Newark. She went into this whole thing. And I have to tell you, people's empathy turned around immediately. And I think that's that's sort of the essence of it is if you can get people to trust you and you can show up as who you really are, the whole relationship changes. And when you have trusting relationships, you really have everything in your career because People, people feel that they can connect with you. And when they can connect with you, they're happy to help. They're happy to um, let you lead them and they will show up and do their very best every single day. That's an amazing, powerful story. I also want to touch on something that Melinda um, spoke about and it's something that you've spoken about before and it's about not segmenting. You can't have work friends and your friend friends. So that's that division that needs to, you're, they're your friends, right? 
Yeah, the, your work friends are your friends. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't have any friends without work friends, by the way. So <laughs> I also think it's about, um, to a certain extent, you become, when you share these things, you become a family. Um, and that's where people feel safe. And it's not just about, you know, you as um, a leader coming in and being somebody they can trust, but many times people are going through things and it may affect their performance. And if they don't feel like they can talk to you about it, it bottles up and it becomes more of a problem. Whereas if you create a safe space for people to have these conversations, it lets the pressure out of the system. And then you can figure out how to support them too, because your job is to help them to be successful. If they're successful, you're successful. So the only way you can do that is if you have that bond of trust that allows people to feel safe to come forward and have those conversations. Excellent. I and think the one thing I'd like to build on there is it, it's true with respect to your career thoughts as well. Um, I, I always remember a, a woman who was great who, who worked for me and I noticed her performance not being terrific. And I was very puzzled. And when I finally asked you, I said, why, why are you distracted? What's going on? It was because her husband was contemplating a move to a different state. And she was worrying about, you know, maybe having to give up her job. And so we were able to talk about that. And we were able to talk about her career aspirations. And ultimately, her husband did move. She did leave the company and, and connected. We helped her connect to a different job. But then several years later, she came back. And because we'd had an honest conversation about, you know, what her aspirations were, what she, uh, she could do, how she wanted to grow her career, we could both help her uh, connect to the right job outside, but then also come back to the right job inside. And, and making transitions within a company, that's also true. It's, it's so great to bring up what are you wanting to learn next and to be honest about that and because opportunities may open up in your own company versus always having to look outside if you can if you can authentically talk about that with with your uh, supervisor or with with others in the organization excellent deborah thank you I, you know melinda another point too that i know that you talk about and it's about opening yourself up to opportunities, as Deborah said earlier, and saying yes to things that you normally wouldn't say yes to. Um, that's one of my favorite mantras to, as well as to say yes to what's coming next. Yeah. So talk to me about how you've said yes to various aspects of your career journey that landed you in this fabulous children's hospital where you're sitting right now. Yeah, maybe I could just talk about that, a, a shameless promotion for children's <laughs> hospital. I'm here in Washington, D.C. actually arrived late last night. Um, that's the bags under my eyes. Uh, it's very early in the morning, my time. Uh, and uh, I'm here on the Children's New Campus, Children's Hospital New Campus, which is the old, the original Walter Reed Medical Center uh, that was mothballed while they built a new Walter Reed Medical Center. And now we're bringing it back to its original purpose of serving patients but it's also an interdisciplinary campus. So on this campus, we have a rare disease institute, a genomics institute, a device innovation lab, we have Virginia Tech, and we have J Labs. And the whole purpose is to do translation of research from bench to the bedside. So I'm here on the, the um, outpatient facility that's now open. It's so exciting to be here and to see this campus come to life. And things like that give me joy. And that's what your career should be about, is not just what can you achieve professionally, but what will fulfill you personally. And I've always taken that tact in my life when I've gone through my journey is to say, what am I going to do that builds my skills, but also builds my experience as a person because that makes us better too. So I, I loved what uh, I think it was either Sharon said about having two tracks. Um, one is a very, um, very specific track where you go up the step ladder and it's very intentional and you're heading up the executive chain. And the other track is, you know, whatever comes, you know, embrace it and hang on to it 
and fully commit to it. And I did both. The first part of my career was very uh, traditional. I went to a tech industry, uh, a big global technology company. I had my track all mapped out in advance. I knew exactly what kinds of experiences I wanted in various countries because I also wanted that experience of living in different cultures and suspending judgment of what I believe was right and wrong and learn what all these different cultures that were right and wrong so I could really refashion myself based on what I believe. And I did that for the first 10 years of my life and I thought I was going to keep going that way until I, I got sick. Um, and I landed in the hospital and I was told I wasn't going to make it. And that absolutely changed my perspective on things. I knew that if I got the chance to stay here on this planet, that I had to dedicate my life to something that I felt passionate about where I can make a difference. And that was innovation in healthcare because clearly there wasn't enough of it. So I completely changed track from like a big company, tech industry, very, um, a very uh, structured path moving forward to entrepreneurship in the life science industry. I started off from scratch. It was like I threw away 10 years of experience and started over, although that gave me a great base. Um, and I and I fully committed to it. And I think that's the big thing. There's no right or wrong answer. It's about fully committing to what you take on. There are trade-offs. And once you evaluate the trade-offs and you make a decision, then you fully embrace it and you, you kill it. You do the best that you can and opportunities will continue to follow you. And so I started off as an entrepreneur and realized that, you know, even though I was on this executive track, I actually knew very little about business. Once you have to be an entrepreneur, you do everything from scratch yourself. It was an incredibly grounding experience. Um, and I think it's really important, the whole aspect of getting those hard skills. I thought that was such a great point. Understand finance and marketing and statistics and all that stuff. And from, you know, starting off on my own and raising some money um, and getting my first, uh, you know, J Labs 1.0 started. Uh, I ended up meeting a big company. We ended up partnering together and now we've expanded all over the globe and I'm back on that, you know, executive and a big company track. And so, you know, I would say the key to success is embrace it and give it your all. Cause you know, what's, what's it all about? We're only, on this planet for a moment and you want to make those moments count so you want to do work that's important to you with people that you love spending your time with exactly thank you so much for that and thank you for sharing your story so you know going back to deborah's initial comment there really isn't a roadmap it's a personal journey that you need to undertake to fulfill joy your fulfill your own curiosity build those authentic relationships and do something purposeful um and you all have achieved that remarkably well um but at the same time there had to be some moments where you had some self-doubts women are often uh ascribed to having imposter syndrome how does one overcome that? Because you're sitting in a room, sometimes you're the N of one. You may be the only woman who's there. Um, and how do you find your authentic voice then? Uh, Melinda, I'm gonna kick it off with you since um, that's where you left off. Uh, how did you find your authentic voice and how did you overcome any self-doubts you might've had? Well, listen, I grew up with five brothers. And All right, there you go. <laughs> uh, that helped, uh, but even with that, I would say you go into a room full of people who um, maybe have come from a different background, uh, many more advantages than you did, um, and who know a lot of people and know a lot of stuff. And it and, and you know inside you it doesn't matter. You know, you know, options and um, potential answers. And many times you sit there doubting yourself, and it's it's not unique to any of you, we all do it. And that's half the battle is first recognizing everybody has that. So it's not just you, everybody does it. And the worst thing to do is to wish afterwards that you had said something like that regret of, I knew the answer, I should have said it, somebody else said it, you know, and now it's bottled up inside of it and it pays the price. So don't pay the price be bold in the moment and speak up. And what's the worst that can happen? You know, um, in my life, I've uh, hung on to this one phrase, uh, which I say all the time to my team, which is life 
expands or contracts in direct proportion to your courage. All right, let me say it again. Life expands or contracts in direct proportion to your courage. So if you have the courage to say something, guess what? You're going to feel better. That idea might be taken on. People may run with it. It may contribute to the solution. Um, and that's the same in any opportunity. It may seem risky. You know, it may seem like it's out of your grasp, but you don't know until you try. And it pays to believe and then surround yourself with all the resources that can help you be successful so it's about the courage and you don't want to pay the price and saying i wish i had i wish i had said that love that deborah i'm going to turn to you um and ask you as you have managed and led several large organizations did you have any doubts along the way as to, you know, is this the right thing for me? And how do you, how did you overcome those if you had any at all? Because you're pretty courageous, so. Well, oh, thank you, Tara. And I, I think the, the, the biggest doubt I had was moving from a 17 year career at Novartis, which I had loved and thrived in and had so many great opportunities and loved the people that I worked with to, to go and lead uh, my first company, Millennium, and you know that question of can I can I do this, and how do you move from something where you're very successful and well known, and you you have such a fun at work, and is the desire to take on something different, uh, you know, is it valid? Is it is it worth doing? What if you fail? It's very public, so going through all of those discussions, but eventually. It, it fit my vision of wanting to bring uh, transformative medicines forward and also learn more about the breadth of the business and not be as much functionally oriented. Um, and so I said, you know, you've, you've always talked about this. We've had discussions at Novartis about this is, this is your desire in your career. So when the opportunity comes, if you don't seize it, what, what does that say about your courage and what does that say about your vision and eventually saying if if not now then when and basically taking the leap that way and it was incredibly difficult more challenging than i could have imagined and i had to learn more things than i could ever imagine but you're never doing it alone mm. i was surrounded by a phenomenal team at millennium people who knew much, much more about their functions than I did and who were very open to help me learn. And I think when you make a shift into something that's new to you, just being humble to that and reaching out and saying, hey, I, I don't know, but, but I can learn if you help me um, is really, really important. And so, yes, does one have doubts in, in making you know, difficult decisions, either big investment decisions, which, you know, really are have an opportunity cost or restructuring decisions in a company. Those those are incredibly painful and, and difficult. But again, you, one's never alone in it. Yes, you might be where the bucks eventually stops. Um, but if you've got a great team, uh, you're never in it alone. Fantastic. And I'd like to add, if not now, when? And if not you, who? Right? Isn't that another one? If it's so, that's a great saying. And I love the fact that you have to be a little bit vulnerable as well um, in terms of making some of these decisions, because admitting that you don't know something can be quite unsettling, especially if you are uh, in a position where you're surrounded by only other men or and you're the only woman. You don't want to ever feel that you don't know something. But I think that's really key is to admit when you don't know something as well and ask for the best advice you can possibly get. Uh, Lori, uh, talk to me about any self-doubts you may have had. You've been now at the HBA for 15 years. You ran a leather large organization before that. So do you, how did you find your voice? And you had to find your voice amongst a lot of voices as the leader of the HBA. Well, I think the being vulnerable, and I can tell you, um, uh, Dr. D has 
given me much advice over over these years and um and i wouldn't have got that advice if i hadn't been vulnerable and asked her um and she told me because she is a bold leader and i followed it and it has been right every time so she's she's got great um instincts i think i'll go back to uh melinda your point about speaking up i I think that is like the most incredible thing. When you are in a meeting, you you must speak up. And even if you feel intimidated because that roommate in your head starts whispering imposter syndrome kind of quips to you, um, there's something about um, reframing it that it is my duty. I've been invited to that meeting for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I spoke up, and I, I sort of felt that that was my duty, that helped me and I spoke up, then it made it so much easier throughout the meeting to add something, and this time probably more meaningful, um, to the discussion. So just make sure at the beginning of the meeting, start um, as you mean to go on. So that that's one thing. The second is, I used to think it was about functional expertise that totally was the reason you advanced and you got the respect in the room. But what I started to learn is it's actually quite impressive if you can connect thoughts, Mm. right? Because if you can connect the dots between people's idea, that's when innovation starts to really come into the room. And and if you creatively and respectfully um, challenge a longstanding belief, uh, it gives confidence to people that something they've never challenged, like turn it upside down and have a look at it. And the majority of the time you find ideas and solutions that emerge that you never would have thought of if you hadn't um, created that in the room. So you didn't have to be the expert. You just simply had to to be the prodder to the people that are are in that room. I always believe it's about who you who you surround yourself with. So you don't have to necessarily be the smartest person in in the room um, to excel. And then I think the third thing um, is that good girl mindset. Um, And I do think it might be a little bit more of a generational thing, but I definitely was taught about being um, polite and respectful. and, And I equated it to people liking you. And that was very important to me. And I learned over the years, especially from my male colleagues, it's about business. Business has to come first. And you can develop outstanding relationships that are so strong that help you through actually calling it like it is. And as Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, said, my mother told me to be a lady. And for that, uh, to her, it meant be your own person, be independent. So that helped me when I start to think about, you know, being a lady and or doing something like that. I think, hey, if RBG can do it, I have to follow in her footsteps. I love that. That's something that both Deborah and Lori said, which I think is um, is such a great point. Deborah talked about not being the functional expert, but then you're in the room with all of these people. How do you lead when you're a function? You're not a functional expert. There's all these people who know more than you. And uh, something that Lori said is is what we all aspire to do as leaders, which is connect the dots. Yep. Right. So how do we take all of these opinions and help build a better picture, but also create a safe space so people who don't feel like they can express their voice get a chance to do that? And and that becomes then our way of paying it forward. How do you create that safe space? And if you are feeling uncomfortable, a way to do that is to connect other people's dots, too. Oh, I really like that idea. And that reminds me of how you could do this. And your idea combined with that idea could bring this and it builds your confidence to say more. And that's really what leadership at the top level is. It's not being the expert in everything. It's about how to bring out the best from your people and figuring out how to build a better picture together. So I really like those points. Absolutely. Sharon, I'm going to let you weigh in here. I know that um, you have some thoughts about how to overcome doubts. Um, Again, it goes back to being that authentic leader. And you are an expert at connecting dots as well. Well, I I don't have much to add to what all these brilliant women have said, except that um, confidence is a muscle Mm -hmm. and you have to keep exercising it. So um, I'll, I'll tell you what I used to do when I was really early in my career. 
before I go into a meeting, I would just say, I do not believe in defeat. I do not believe in defeat. I would, I would reiterate that to myself. Um, I would also say that other people value my contribution and that I just made that a mantra. And, you know, as you start to teach yourself that, then it becomes true. And, um, and I, the only other thing I would add is that if you're not confident in meetings, but you speak up anyway, after the meeting, ask someone for feedback. How do you think that went? How do you think my, um, idea landed on people and be open to the feedback. You know, some of it's going to be positive. Some of it's going to be negative. You don't have to believe everything you hear, but, um, I, you know, I would ask for feedback and I would definitely exercise that confidence muscle. Excellent. That goes back to that vulnerability piece of it too. So if you're asking for feedback, you have to be open to being exposed in some ways as well. So, um, I think those are, and that's tough, right? So yes, Deborah. I was going to just say, I, I think, Sharon, you captured that beautifully. You know, confidence is a muscle. Uh, but remember, sometimes the first time you exercise that, particularly, and, you know, we, we talk about uh, women here, but it applies also to other uh, diverse populations. Right. That the first time you might speak up and your voice and the way you come at something is different because of your of your background the people who are the mainstream, whatever that is, be it color, be it gender, be it whatever, might hear it, not hear it, or hear it differently, run right over it. And so there's a, there is a need to learn skills of how do you manage having your voice heard? And you can, yes, build your confidence, bring, you know, bring your voice to the table. But if your voice is not being heard, what are the strategies to manage that? For instance, being interrupted or being talked over or being ignored and, and thinking about strategies to, to handle that politely and respectfully, if you're being interrupted, to say, may I just finish, um, generally will discipline people into uh, allowing you, you to finish. But little strategies like that can help you out of the box of, oh my goodness, I said something and I got run over and feeling that that then defeats you and doesn't allow you to speak up. I, I think it's very important to learn those little uh, strategies that you can carry into the meeting with you if you're going to be the only uh, of any uh, different description. And if you are a more senior woman in the room, you can really help another of any person of any description, be it a woman, be it be it a shy man, be it a, a different a person of different ethnicity, you can reach out to them and ask for their idea. You can really be that person who opens uh, the door and the way for them. And I think we can each take that responsibility. Well, and I think if we go back to what you first started with, Deborah which is, why are we here? Mm -hmm. And if you keep that front and center, mm -hmm. um, that we're here to serve patients and you imagine success, you imagine patients hoping and praying that we're fighting for them. And if, if they're hoping and praying that we're fighting for them, well, that gives you the courage to speak up. And so we need to imagine what success looks like. Imagine that mission being accomplished and how good that feels. And then it's worth it to take that risk, to um, take that moment and say something, to grab that ring and say, I'm going for it. Um, because that's why we're all here at the end of the day. And that, um, that opportunity to fight for our patients, um, that, that's a remarkable privilege for us. So absolutely what's going absolutely i say that this all the time that there are remarkable people who work in the life sciences industry who could apply their skills to any other industry but they do so for 
patients because they are committed to improving healthcare around the world. So that's a very special thing that you all do. Uh, Deborah, I just want to go back to, to address the point you made about having those little tips and techniques to manage through some of those conversations. It's a shame that we still have to think about that in this day and age that is 2021, that we still have to have those techniques, but we do because if we're going to be heard, we need to be able to cut through the noise and establish our place at the table. So it's so important. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, we have a few minutes left before we go into our Q&A session. So I'm gonna do a lightning round before I get to our wow moment. And I'm gonna ask you to tell me one thing that you wish you knew then that you know now as you were moving up the ranks. So dial back the Wayback Machine and think about the one thing that you wish that you knew as you were moving up. Lori, I'll start with you since you're nodding your head at me. <laughs> sure thing, um, it's transferable skills. So I moved through my career doing different things because of, of life changes. So I was working in a hospital directly with patients. Then I went to working in pharma in Europe. And then I went, um, I was down uh, down under. Um, and then I did work in a global uh, nonprofit. So I kept doing different things. and. I hadn't seen the transferable skills and my and and that sort of you know aha moment is those transferable skills are transferable and you just have to think about what it is you're doing um, because that's when you look at a job description and you look at it differently because if you get someone to help you look at that job description and say well you didn't do that exactly that way but what you did over here is that and when you start to do that you realize you are absolutely capable to do perhaps a, the next step or or an, a, in another role in another uh, firm that you didn't think was applicable and it is so i would say i wished i had better understood um, my transferable skills excellent that's connecting your own dots then so <laughs> i'm a dot connector for myself okay <laughs> sharon you're next um, I wish I had known earlier in my career that anxiety is real. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, worrying and being afraid that I was going to do the wrong thing instead of just being human and realizing that I, I can make mistakes and so can everyone else. Um, and I think I was so worried about getting everything perf perfect that I probably didn't focus on the bigger, more important things, not only at work, but in my life. So I maybe would have managed it differently or manage it the way that I do now, which is identifying, I'm, you know, this is an anxious moment for me. I'm feeling really anxious. Um, I, I can see it in myself when I get short with people or when I'm not connecting with people the way I normally do. And then you have to manage it by breaking the cycle, taking a walk, taking three deep breaths, or even realizing that maybe it's time for a vacation. Maybe you need a break from this. Because when you manage that anxiety that we all have, um, it's when you're able to be your best. You show up, you make smart decisions, and you're able to lead others, especially in the anxious times that we have now. You, People are looking for credible hope. And we as leaders can supply that, but not if we're riddled with anxiety. I love that. Yes, anxiety is real. I, I, I agree with that. Um, Dr. D, I'm going to turn to you now. I think that, you know, there's a quote from, I believe it's Winston Churchill, who says, success is not final and failure is not fatal. And in some ways, I wish I'd known that. And it connects a lot to what, what Sharon just said of, you know, wanting everything to be perfect and seeing anything but perfection as as failure, and and feeling that that failure can can never happen, and and of course that's unrealistic. And but it causes a lot of um, sometimes risk aversion that can be hindering to the business. You don't stretch enough. Um, if you're not prepared to fail, you won't innovate. Uh, you won't reach beyond. Uh, so understanding that, yeah, failure is not fatal and you can take and must indeed for the best outcomes, take some risk. And of course you have to take sensible risks. So, you know, getting advice, getting uh, input and data, but 
but eventually you've you've got to be prepared to fail if you're going to really move um, on innovation or transformation of yourself or your business. Love that. Thank you, Deborah. Melinda, want to take us home for this one? Um, I think the biggest aha moment in my career, which I wish I would have known sooner, which served me well moving forward after that, was um, the notion that everybody is making it. There is no real right answer. I'll never forget going into my first hardcore BD role in a tech uh, in, in the tech industry. And I went into a pricing discussion. I've never done pricing. And I thought, oh my God, here are all these experts. And quite frankly, uh, there were some common sense things like, you know, well, how much did it cost to make this? What is everybody else charging? And then after that, it was just throwing spaghetti against the wall. I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. And after that, I was very liberated to think about everybody's just making up. It's really using your common sense, doing your homework, working hard, reaching out to people. But really, all of us have that opportunity to um, create new solutions, to come up with new options, as long as we know everybody's got a level playing field in that regard. And so you can make it up just as well as anybody else. Fantastic. We have some questions coming in from the audience. And if we don't get to them all now, we are going to have some of our panelists go into the lounges and we can have this discussion, uh, continue that discussion in there. But since this is our Woman of the Week WOW podcast, I do need to ask you all to provide me with a quick synopsis of the WOW moment of your careers that either changed your trajectory of your career or has continued to be an influence in your career. And I'll start with you, Dr. D. I think I, I, I referenced it is mm -hmm. when, I, when I took the risk to fail and moved from a really comfortable spot into something that, that I aspired to learn, that I knew I wasn't fully equipped for, um, but took, took the shot, um, acknowledging that I could, I could end up in a very uncomfortable position of failing. And I think that, that reach was something that just was so rewarding and delivered work I could be so passionate about with people that I really enjoyed that I was so glad that I had taken that risk. Uh, so just being prepared to step beyond the comfort zone. Well, thank you, because all of that risk has led to some great innovation and transformation in the life sciences industry. So fabulous. Sharon, I'll turn to you. Um, my wow moment happened about five years ago, believe it or not. My company was reorganizing and um, uh, somebody that I had been colleagues with was going to be my boss. And I was very upset that I didn't get the job. And, um, you know, I sort of for a day thought, Ugh, I hate this company. I'm going to find another job. I've been treated so unfairly, you know, kind of all the emotions that you go through. And then I decided, you know what? I am not going to be that person that complains. I'm going to find out why. And I actually uh, took my own advice, the advice I give people all the time. If you have a problem, then talk to somebody who can do something about it. So I went to, uh, you know, I went to the CEO of our company and just said, why, why didn't I get the job? And he told me, and it was for a very, very good reason. And when he actually described the job to me, it's not something I would really want to do or I would be good at. I just sort of felt like I deserved the title and the and 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 it really wasn't going to be a good fit. And I think, you know, what Melinda just said about expressing yourself, it sets you free. If you can say what you feel, even if the answer isn't what you want, and you understand why decisions are being made, you, you will always feel so much better. That's amazing. And that goes back to being vulnerable again and looking for that piece of advice that you may not want to hear. Right. So Lori, I'm going to turn to you. What is your wow? So it is about um, learning fast versus failing fast. And it's reframing what failure means. And I learned that um, back in the days of the big blockbusters in pharma. Um, and uh, it was very, very hard for 
the scientists and the folks I was working across the spectrum of pharma. Um, and they didn't want to kill their products, their babies that they had been working on. But we had to find the, the candidate had the most promise. Mm -hmm. And so we had to reframe what failure was. And that helped me a lot in terms of seeing things not as failure, but as opportunities that if I was able to learn from, um, and it, it opened up this growth mindset, um, which is it is actually hard for me. I like to be right. I like to be perfect. So being able to see that failure is as helpful. And the thing that um, was my real wow moment is that I was able to do that and my colleagues weren't. And so I started to coach my colleagues on how to deal with that. And that's when I learned that that's where my calling was. It was more in helping others than being the one um, doing it. So that was my wow moment. No, thank you. I know you've helped me immensely over the years, so I appreciate that. Melinda? We're all glad, we're all glad for it, Laurie. Yes. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Um, well, I, I know many of you have heard my wow moment too many times. Uh, it was when I was on my deathbed and wasn't sure I was going to make it. And there's something about that moment that cleanses all of the um, – fears or motivations you have to choose things for status, power, position, recognition, all of that goes out the window. And suddenly you do things for meaning. So what am I, what choice am I going to make? Because it has meaning to me. And I tell you, whenever I'm frustrated, I don't know what choice to make, or I, you know, I'm scared to do something. I take myself back to that night in my hospital bed after they told me it wasn't going to make it. And I close my eyes and I imagine that again. And I live there and it's very uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable and everybody should do it. Everybody should try it. And then I open up my eyes and then I look at my options with a, a, a new frame of reference of meaning. And I make my decisions from that. And uh, there are some moments where, you know, listen, not everything goes right. You're not always on a pedestal. Um, and when you are in those moments, taking yourself back and asking yourself, if you strip away all that stuff, what really matters and what should you do now? It becomes pretty crystal clear. Well, I would say that is an incredible wow moment because it is for you, it was a matter of life and death. And those learnings that you took from that and what you've done to transform the life sciences industry has been quite incredible. Um, we have about two minutes left and I'm gonna throw one big question out there or one of the questions from the audience real fast. Um, and just raise your hand if you'd like to jump in and then we'll take some of these other questions and we'll bring them into our lounges afterwards. So. One of the questions is when it goes back to when you get the chance to speak up, if you don't 100% nail it, that in that in initial instance, that goes back to your thoughts there, Melinda, how do you pick up from there and muster the courage to get the next opportunity, to get to that next opportunity? So if you didn't do it the first time, how do you get to do it the next time? So raise well, your hand if you want to jump in. Yeah, we'll just, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to do it. And I feel like we've yeah. messed up on speaking up and we feel like everybody's looking at us and it was much bigger in our heads than what it really was. Nobody probably even noticed. Uh, everybody passed on and you're still living in that moment. So you have to get over yourself. It's not as big as you think. Keep on going, keep on trucking. I just reiterate what Sharon said, confidence is a muscle. You just, a you got to just keep doing it because you get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You and ask for feedback, and you might hear what Le Melinda just said. Oh, I didn't even realize. I yeah. didn't get that. It messed up, but nobody else thought that. Excellent. Well, um, ladies, I could spend another hour but unfortunately I'm not allowed to. Um, so I want to thank you all sincerely for being vulnerable, showing us how we can flex our courage muscle and that uh, Melinda's quote, that uh, courage expands in context. Uh, Deborah, your devotion to innovation and transformation and Lori, your empathy in terms of leading that next generation of leaders has really been remarkable for myself as well as for the industry. You all have had such a ripple effect and I don't know that you appreciate 
the impact that you have had on so many people around the world. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, I also need to do a little housekeeping here at the end. Um, thank you to all of you, as I said, to our attendees, to our other WOW attendees who are in the audience. And a thank you to our sponsors, Bioforum, Greenfire, Cario Farm Therapeutics, W2O, and WCG. Um, and if we learned anything this morning, to quote Jeannie Romady, CEO of IBM, it's that growth and comfort do not coexist. <laughs> and I think you all have proven that to the tens today. So thank you again. And for our audience and for our panelists, please join us in the lounge to continue the conversation. Click on the leave button on the session page and then click on the lounge icon on the menu toolbar. See you there in a few minutes. And again, my sincere thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Taryn. everyone. Thanks, Taryn. Thank Thanks, you all. Taryn.